Welcome to Shaping the Way We Teach English webinar course 15, brought to you by the American English team. My name is Jenny Hodgson, part of the American English team based in Washington, D.C. Welcome teachers who are joining us from all over the world. Here you can see the course 15 schedule. Today is the fifth webinar of course 15. We have one more webinar in this course, and course 16 will begin April 22nd. As you know, during these webinars, you will hear but not see the presenter. And the way for you to participate is by using the chat box as you are already doing. This is where you can ask questions and make comments related to today's topic. You will see myself, moderator Jenny, and moderator Heather, moderator Tony, and moderator Katie in the chat box to help you. But we also rely on the webinar community to help each other. Your presenter will ask you questions in the form of polls. These are multiple choice questions that will appear for you on the screen. We know that sometimes you may experience technical difficulties, and unfortunately we cannot fix individual technical issues, but we will let you know if we are having a global problem. But if you do lose sound, a great way to follow along is with the caption pod. Webinars consist courses are um, in sets of six webinars, and during the course, they take place every other Wednesday. If you participate in at least four out of six webinars, then you will receive an e-certificate from your local U.S. Embassy or Regional English Language Officer. To ensure that you are eligible for the certificate, we ask that you submit your attendance only at the very end of the webinar. Please do not submit it before we request it. For individuals, you only need to submit your email address, and for viewing hosts, please include the number of participants. We know that many of you are already familiar with our name site, but if you haven't registered yet, please do join this site. This is where you can find resources and discussion questions related to each session, and this is where you can also ask the presenter additional questions after the webinar. We also post pre-webinar readings and the recording and presentation after the session. So you can go back and watch the webinar again or look at the PowerPoint. For today's session, it's entitled Networking, Making Connections That Last. Professional development can reinvigorate and excite us about our career give us time to work on our craft, and allow for reflection on our past struggles and triumphs. One important aspect of professional development is networking. Having strong networking skills can make a huge difference in a teacher's ability to confront many of the daily obstacles we face. Globalization and technology has made our teaching community increasingly more connected. But even without access to more advanced form technology, we have basic strategies to help us build our professional network. This webinar will discuss how we can become more connected to our colleagues, both near and far, and how this can benefit us and our students in and out of the classroom. Our pre presenter today is Amy Scucci, and she graduated from New York University with a BA in Middle Eastern Studies and from American University with an MA in TESOL. She has taught ESL and EFL in many different types of programs, including secondary, post-secondary, academic preparation, intensive English, and adult education across the U.S., and as an English language fellow in Egypt. As a member of the Employment Issues Committee of TESOL, Amy understands the importance of professional development both for the teacher and for the sustainability and success of the program or institution in which the teacher works. She currently resides in California, teaching in a university setting and working for an online certification company. So welcome, Amy. We're really excited for your topic today.
Hi everyone, I'm really excited to be talking with you today um, about something that I really get excited about, which is networking. Um, I was watching the polls as you guys started to log in and it, it looks like almost 100% of you um, really think networking is important and that you enjoy networking. Um, and I think that those two things are are just the basis for everything, which is which is great. So I'm so excited to hear that. Um, and I think our title today is Networking, Making Connections That Last, um, really gets at the um, essence of what we're going to talk about. So not only making the connections, um, but maintaining them and keeping them um, alive and thriving. Um, and being able to utilize them to the best of our ability, um, which is arguably the more difficult of the two. Okay, so as a teacher, um, when I'm looking at a new word or vocabulary word, um, I really like to break it down and um, think about the different meanings and the different definitions and how they interact and relate to each other and to other words. Um, so if we take networking and we make it network, um, you know, we can determine, okay, this is both a noun and a verb. What does this mean? So I actually went to the dictionary, um, and Merriam-Webster defines a network as a group of people or organizations that are closely connected um, and that work with each other. So I would also add to this, um, in my personal definition of it, is that there's an assumption that those people and organizations are working to mutually support one another, that they are working together maybe towards a common goal. So we become educators because we want to better our students' lives which may in turn better our communities. So I might argue that we have an inherent desire to connect to other people and work to make ourselves and our classroom and our students and even our communities better tomorrow than they are today. <clears throat> so if you look at the pictures here on this slide, um, I found these three different pictures which I think really get at the essence of what we're trying to talk about and accomplish. Um, the first one is kind of comical, right, with this guy in um, probably casual business attire out in a field with a net. Uh, but I think what I liked about this was this um, kind of visual of an actual net and of actually catching something in that net. And whether it's contacts or people or input, information or resources, that you are always collecting these things as a teacher. Um, and then the middle picture, right, we have this um, figure of these people standing around and either throwing this man up or, or catching him if he's falling. And we don't really know, but I think, again, that that kind of gets at what a network can do for us. It can either support us if we're falling or struggling, or it can kind of throw us up and require us to do something, maybe take a risk, um, or do something new. Uh, and then the last picture, right, with the computer and the people um, clearly on different continents, but all connected, um, I think gets at, you know, this aspect of what technology can do for our network and our networking skills, right? That it's hard to talk about network um, at this point with the amount of technology that we have um, and not talk about how that technology allows us to grow our network. So with all of these things in mind, um, we're going to talk about how to do this a little bit more. So um, again, when I, going back to maybe, you know, just when we're teaching in the classroom also, when we have more of an abstract term, something like networking that isn't necessarily tangible that we can see and touch that, you know, I like to ask, what does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? To get an idea of how we might describe this term. So in the chat box, I would love if you could share 
um, maybe your ideas using these sentence starters. So networking looks like what, or networking sounds like, or networking feels like. So please, in the chat box, take a chance to share with us some of your thoughts of how you might describe networking um, in your context. There's no right or wrong answer. It's your opinion. Um, maybe, you know, it might feel scary, right, if you're not, if it's not something that you're comfortable doing. So I see um, networking looks like a group of people working together or communication. Um, I see Alma says it feels exciting. I love that. Open interaction from Patty. A beehive. Oh, I think that's a great um, analogy. Um, Mona says it looks like a web, which I, I also agree with. Many different connections. Spidery. These are great adjectives. Um, interaction. Uh, I love this. Linda Moore mentions that it's an organization with a clear objective of sharing. I agree. It feels like a family. Lindita. Yes, definitely like a family. That supportive environment. Abla Majid says it's challenging, I agree, or challenging and exciting. And Pedro mentions that it feels like a connection. I think that's great. Okay. So I really quickly, when I was thinking about this thought of my own um, endings to these sentences, um, and again, there's no right or wrong answer. It can be all of these, or it can be different depending on how you um, see it or feel it. So I just said that it looks like emailing or maybe posting to social media. Um, it sounds like talking and typing, right? So this idea that there's some form of communication. It's not one-sided. You know, you need to have more than one person, and you need to have more than one person um, communicating, right? And then it feels friendly, um, collegial, exciting, as some of you already mentioned, and supportive, which I think, you know, when we say it feels like family, that it, that kind of gets at that supportive aspect of this. So if we look, what what is networking? What are some actual examples that you can do? So the first step, right, obviously, is to introduce yourself. So you know, this might be something that is difficult for some of us to step out of our comfort zone and maybe introduce ourselves to someone we know. And for some of us, it might be very easy to um, walk up to someone we don't know and introduce ourselves. But you know, either, you know, whether this is something you're comfortable with or not, it's something that you, you need to do sometimes in order to grow your network. So, you know, saying hello, shaking hands, or whatever you know, kind of introduction um, protocol you have in your culture, um, making small talk. So this is the first step. You have to put yourself out there. Um, you, you know, it helps if you can find commonalities, right? Maybe you work in the same place or you work in the same city. Maybe you teach similar classes or the same type of class. Um, who do you know? Maybe you have people you know in common um, whether from your own city um, or from, you know, a class or a course that you took earlier on. Even some things that seem inconsequential like TV shows or um, sports teams or, you know, family things. Maybe you come from a big family or a small family, right? Just finding something to connect on um, can be very, very helpful. Um, business cards, I think, are this traditional kind of icon of networking, um, which we still use a lot. They can still be very helpful to, you know, disseminate your contact information. Sometimes it helps if you write a little note on the card, right, when you hand it out to help that person remember who you are, especially if you're at a conference or something that, you know, where people are collecting a lot of these business cards. You want them to remember which person you were that gave it to them. And then finally um, would be sharing, right? Either offering to collaborate or share materials or ideas or even as asking for help. So if you know that the person um, teaches something similar and you're having a concern um, that, you know, we, 
you might just say, you know, hey, this is the issue I'm having. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about it. So if you could, just raise your hand um, and think about, have you done any of these things in the pursuit of networking? So some of these things we just do anyway, but maybe you have actually offered to share or you hand out business cards. or So really quickly, you can just let us know if you do this already. Is this something you already do on a regular basis? Okay, it definitely looks like a lot of you do these things already, which is great. So I think when we're talking about networking, we're talking, um, I tend to divide these things into two categories. The first being formal networking. Um, and this is maybe, you know, maybe that more traditional idea of what we think networking includes. Formal introductions, right? The one picture, they're clearly at a business meeting. Right, um, and then the other picture may be at a conference setting um, where you're attending different presentations. So these are formal introductions, um, workplace functions, things like that. The other um, part might be, you know, what I would consider informal networking, um, and these are the kinds of things that we might not even consider networking, that we do on a regular basis, but we don't even realize that we are, are actually um, creating and maintaining our network. So these are things like outside of work team building, um, maybe emailing a coworker regarding a non-work related activity or idea. Um, I put a picture of a coffee shop because sometimes just taking a work meeting outside of work can change the dynamics. Um, you know, even if you have a weekly faculty meeting, maybe you know once a month or even once every other month, you can suggest that you have that meeting, but you just do it not at work, some other place. I also put a picture. This is a personal picture of mine at a, of a beach um, at a school where I used to teach. We had an annual retreat where we took one day and all the faculty and administration would go together and we would have some very formal meetings um, on our curriculum and some professional development. Um, but our school was near the ocean and so we would always take our lunch break and eat together at the beach. And so during this time we took a break from work and we just talked about what was going on in our lives. It was very relaxing, it was nice to be outside and this deepened our work relationships more than anything else we would do that day. So I think it can be really powerful to have those relationships outside of work, which I'm sure many of you already know. So this is what I might consider more of just general um, relationship maintenance, if you will. Um, so the more, you know, the deeper connection that you have with another colleague, the more likely you are to support one another professionally. Okay? Um, so here, you know, some relationships you're going to have are going to be strictly professional, and that's fine. Um, but you, you know, you will understand your situation um, and culture and institutional expectations and determine the best way to cultivate these relationships. Just know that you have different options and doing different things might, or even doing different things with different people might strengthen those relationships more. So we're going to go to the polls now. And I'd like you to think about what you do more often. Do you do more formal networking or do you do more informal networking? Wow, okay, that was <laughs> really fast. And it looks like a lot of you are doing a lot more informal networking, which I think is totally normal. Um, like I said, I think these are things we do without, they've become very second nature and especially if you are you know you have a good sense of community you know in your institution or your local area um, then you're more likely probably to um, engage in these informal networking okay so we're going to move on um, and we're going to think about after we make that connection that first connection we introduce ourselves we find those commonalities what do we do next? Well, we need to follow up. Um, so 
here I have a picture of, you know, we go back to our idea of a net. Um, and this guy is, is catching these people in his net. He's making his introductions. He's making these connections. Um, but then these people are just flying out the back of his net. He's not keeping them, right? So as hard as he is working to catch them, then, you know, he's not benefiting from this networking. Um, so I think this is a great image for what I'd like to convey with follow-up. So, um, you know, it's really important that you maintain these relationships. Um, and the longer that you wait to do that, the more difficult it can be to reconnect with that person. So I like to say as a general rule of thumb that you want to make contact with, you know, a new person in your network within one week. Um, and then it shouldn't end, end there, you know. You continue to maintain that contact. So, you know, for instance, if you go to a conference and you, you know, you make a connection with someone and now you think about, okay, it's been about a week. I need to email them. I need to maintain this connection. What do I do? How do I follow up? And I think that this can be based on two factors. The first is um, what is the surest way to make contact. So for example, if you know the person travels a lot or is in class all day, email might be best. If however the internet connection is not so great, then maybe a letter is better. The second factor is the level of formality you feel is necessary or even the cultural norms within which you work. Email writing can sometimes lead us to be more informal. Or I know I've worked in places that a phone call would be more appropriate due to cultural expectations. So now we're going to go back to the poll and what I would like to know is what are the most common ways that teachers communicate with one another in your country? Um, you know, is email really common, face-to-face -face conversations, um, we have phone calls, text, um, scheduled meetings, Facebook, Skype or conferences, or other. And it looks like the majority of you are using email, which I think, again, is very common. And maybe some face-to-face -face conversation. And this is definitely true, you know, if you are talking about your local network. Um, phone calls is there also. Great. Okay. So this is good. This is, I think, you know, most of what I'm used to also. It's nice to see what other people do. Um, but it looks like maybe email is is what we most use in face-to-face -face and phone conversations is a close second and third. Okay, thank you. So now once we, wanna, we know we need to follow up, how do we make that connection? What do I say? Um, so some of these might seem a little obvious. Obviously, you need to include your name. Um, and then you want them to know who you are, right? So maybe your title. Are you a teacher or an administrator? Um, maybe where you work, right, what school or what level, where you met, was it at a conference, at a presentation, you know, was it at a um, someplace random or a mutual friend or something like that. Um, and then what did you talk about when you met, you know, were you talking about vocabulary strategies or classroom management? Um, and then there's a kind of this optional, I think, when we're looking at this as a formula, Right, that you can connect on a specific concern or issue or, or maybe an opportunity um, for collaboration in the future. So I'm going to show you an example. Um, you'll see that there, this is color-coded. Right? I've put my name in purple and where I work in red. So this is, this is Amy Pascucci from UCSD. UCSD is an acronym for the University of California at San Diego. It's one of the schools that I currently teach at. Um, and in my area, this is a very common acronym, so people would recognize that name pretty quickly. Obviously, maybe if I was writing to someone who is not as familiar with the schools here in California, then I would want to change that. Um, and then I have it was great chatting about our vocabulary strategies at last week's International TESOL Convention. So hopefully you can see the, the yellow, the vocabulary strategies, would be that part of the formula that, you know, mentions what we discussed. And then the blue is where we met. And then the last part is that optional 
part of the formula, right? I've already put some of your suggestions to use this week in class, and I'm looking forward to seeing the results in coming weeks. So this kind of, you know, um, shows that I'm interested in what we talked about, and it leaves it open for future collaboration. So I think that this is, if you can really break this down into a formula and a set, um, set uh, elements that you can include in your follow-up. This is another example that's also color-coded. Um, I'm not going to go through this one, um, you know, step by step. The slides will all be up on the Ning after the webinar, so if you'd like to go back and look at another example, you can. Okay, so I think that this leads us into uh, why we should network. Um, and I'm sure, you know, especially looking at some of your thoughts um, in our pre-webinar discussions and some of the other things you're putting in the chat box, um, it sounds like you are very familiar with these. Um, there are two that I think are the most general and probably the most important. Um, and the first one is that the networking leads us to take risks, to try new things, which is a result of being exposed to new teaching techniques and strategies um, or activities that maybe you hadn't seen or experienced before. So just the pure nature of seeing new things will lead you to try new things. And you know, a network is a great way to be exposed to new strategies and techniques and ideas. Um, the other side of that is support. So when something isn't working or you're struggling in the classroom or with a student, you have this two heads are better than one approach. So, um, you know, your, your institutional network um, can be helpful in this way because these people are familiar with the students and the curriculum and the administration. However, a network of colleagues from outside of your institution might be able to help you look at the problem from a new perspective or even share how they handle similar situations in their own institution. Okay, so from why I should network, we're going to start to look at the benefits of networking. And I really love this image. Um, we go back to our idea of the net of, you know, catching those people that become a part of our network in our net. And once you have good strategies and you work on keeping your network strong, you will feel like you have, in a sense, captured your professional world, right? And the possibilities, um, you know, become endless, I guess, in a way, because you can reach so many new things and try many new things. So in the chat box, I'd like you to share what some of the benefits of networking are that you have already experienced. So maybe think on your current or past networking experience and what were some of the benefits? What were some um, specific things that were a product directly, a direct product of your networking? So improving professional development, sharing ideas, Collaboration job hunting, I see Alejandra added. That's a great one. Learning from others, interaction, professional advance, advancement. Feedback, that's a great one. Adriana, I think, wrote that. Best practices. Sharing and saving time, Adnan, thank you. I've noticed that a lot of um, people wrote in our pre-discussion questions and threads that time is a big constraint. So yeah, I definitely think networking can help us with that. Finding people in the same situations. Yeah, we're gonna talk about that too. You know, just knowing that you're not alone Right? You're not alone in some of the problems that you're having. Lots of people experience them. That can be a really um, powerful feeling. Okay, these are great responses. Thank you. I know for me personally, I feel the most valued and empowered at work when I'm able to connect with others and feel creative and, and validated and valued. 
Um, I noticed that someone did mention employment. Um, and I, I agree, you know, employment, finding employment um, can be what I almost I consider a byproduct of networking. Um, you know, if you're connecting with new people and you know more people and more people know you, um, you know, it, it's kind of a natural result, right, to find out about jobs or to gain employment that way. So I don't always think of it as a, a purpose for networking. It can be. Um, but that more of, more of it is a byproduct, right? That we do it for more of these intrinsic values that we have to be better. Um, but that it will just happen as a result. Okay, so um, Ellen Meyer has these ideas about the power of teacher networks. And I just wanted to share some of these with you. Um, the first section that she says is that Teacher networks, right, support new teachers, reduce teacher isolation, and increase retention rates. So, you know, I think we just actually talked about this with someone mentioning, you know, not feeling alone. Um, and I think that that's so true, right, to, especially depending on your teaching situation. Um, you know, if you teach at multiple schools or maybe your department is very large, right, it can be hard to connect with other um, people, right, and other teachers. So, you know, this idea of having a network can help reduce that feeling of isolation and then usually in turn just make you happier at work. Also, um, sharing the benefits of collaborative group work, including action research. So we'll talk a little bit about action research in a little while, um, but I think a lot of you have already mentioned these ideas, right, that you you collaborate, um, the more, the stronger and bigger your network is, the more opportunities for collaboration that you have. So the power of teacher networks also can enhance your professional practice and nurture teacher leaders. So these other ones we've all kind of been talking about, but I think this one is a little bit new, right? So we know that it can enhance our professional practice. We know that it can make it better. But this idea of nurturing teacher leaders, I thought, was very interesting. So raise your hand if you can remember your first teacher mentor in your career. So raise your hand if you can remember your first teacher mentor. Wow, okay, a lot of people are raising their hands. If you can remember your first teacher mentor. Great. Yeah, I think that that's, um, you know, that's a really special relationship that you can have, especially with the first person who takes the time to help you um, develop your, your craft, as we say. So, you know, think about how it made you feel to have someone reach out and, um, make constructive suggestions and offer to help you be better. I'm sure it made you feel excited. Um, I, you know, I know it did for me. So now on the flip side of that, I would love to see you raise your hand and let me know um, if you have ever had the opportunity to mentor another teacher, maybe a new teacher or maybe a teacher you knew was struggling or had some questions. Have you had the opportunity to then mentor another teacher where you are the one that's helping helping another teacher become better. Okay. Also some some yes responses there. Um, and I think that that's kind of what this is getting at, right? Um, that you know having a network and collaborating with other people gives you that opportunity. You know you we have, you know, administrators participating today, which is wonderful, and their leadership is part of their um, job. But as a teacher, you can also be a leader. So, and it can be feel really good to give back to your profession in some way and enhance the classroom and improve students' experience and language skills. Okay, so the last thing that Ellen Myers mentions is that teacher networks connect teachers to the goals and ideals that drew them to education. Um, and I think that that's a really powerful, right? Ideals, um, 
and goals are very personal. They're very deeply ingrained in us. So imagine the huge impact we can have on one another with some rather small changes, right? And these are things that are deeply connected to us, right? And if we can um, enhance and foster those feelings and, you know, know that if we have our, the ideals that we have when we became teachers and make those better, I think that that's really strong and very powerful. Okay, so now we're going to move into how we manage and manage our network and put it to use. What do we actually do to utilize it once, once we have it, once we've made these great connections, um, we're working on establishing these relationships, now what? You know, now what do we do with them? So when it comes to managing your network, um, I would argue that part of this is organization. So we all have different personalities and different ways that we connect with people. But on some level, you have to find a way to organize the people and the information in your network. And you know, this can be creating an email group um, or just keeping information in a notebook. But I would, I would recommend dedicating some, some amount of energy or time into just managing that network and you know this might include you know what I haven't emailed this person in a few months I really should reach out and see how they're doing what classes they're teaching right now to again just maintain doing that maintenance maintaining those relationships um, so you don't let them go too long and prioritizing information you know what you know categorizing things um, you can make email groups so you're communicating with the same people about the topic that you all are familiar with. So now we're going to talk about how to put your network to use. What are some ways that you can actually collaborate <clears throat> with people and use your network to help you? OK, so I've divided these into two sections. Um, the first is what I'm calling lower tech or more local. So raise your hand, use the raise your hand function if you feel like a lack of technology will make networking difficult. If you feel like a lack of technology would make networking difficult. Okay. Yeah, if you feel like a lack of technology is what is what is your main obstacle? OK. So I'm seeing some yeses and some noes. And um, I think that that's, that's pretty common for some of us to feel like it is. And you know, sometimes we might have access to technology, but maybe we're not so comfortable with it. And that's fine, too. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about both of these, how we can do things without technology and how we can do things with technology. And the first we're going to focus on are these lower tech ones, where maybe maybe we can use just email to get to get these things done. So the first thing is um, what what we might call a lunch and learn, um, or sometimes referred to a brown bag lunch because people bring their food. Um, this is when the faculty within your institution um, eats together and either someone from outside of your institution comes and gives a presentation or you can have one of your colleagues um, give a presentation or you can take turns among your colleagues to give a presentation. Um, or you can even decide to discuss something that might be, you know, department specific, right? Maybe everyone is having a problem um, with students doing their homework or something like that. You know, a specific issue that is directly related to your institution or your department. And it's this idea that you're taking time in which you already would be eating lunch. So I know a lot of people have been mentioning time being a huge obstacle for their professional development. So if you say once a month or once every two months, you take your lunch hour, and you and the rest of your faculty all eat together. So you're doing something you would do anyway. Um, and you take that time to either learn something new um, or 
discuss something that is going on. Um, and this is a very, it's short, right? Because it's just during your lunch hour, so you know that you're not sitting in a three-hour long workshop, right? It's informal. Everybody's eating their lunch. Um, it should be time-sensitive, something that's going to, is relating to something going on right now. And it fosters community because you're doing it together. You're taking the time to spend together. Um, and you will inevitably talk to each other probably about other things, you know, while you're sitting down or after you're done. So it definitely fosters a sense of community. So you can work with your local colleagues and administrators to put on a lunch and learn session once a month. Um, or you can even develop this into something more of like a mini conference, right? Or if you get comfortable with this idea of a lunch and learn, then maybe, you know, once every six months or once a year, you kind of expand that into a mini conference. You know, and you can brainstorm with your colleagues on ideas of how maybe you could present this to your administration. Or if you're an administrator, you know, think about maybe some creative ways to employ this a little bit more. Okay, so the next thing is a teacher support group. And um, I know some of you I saw in the chat box were mentioning things like this. So this is a, would be a local um, teacher network. And you know, if you're already a um, part of a teacher association, then this could be an extension of that association. So you already have some kind of framework in place with your teacher association. Um, and then maybe pose it to that group that you would like to start a support group that meets on a, at a regular time um, to discuss, again, specific things. So these might be teachers that are not necessarily from the same institution or department, um, but you meet regularly to discuss concerns or offer suggest suggestions. Um, again, you can work out the logistics face-to-face -face or via email. Um, I would suggest setting an agenda um, and then stick to that agenda. So if you say, you know, next month we're going to discuss classroom management, make sure that that's what you actually discuss. This will create validity for your group so um, people feel like, you know, you are actually doing something positive. Um, also with that, I, I like to recommend that if you start a teacher support group um, that you that everyone involved commits to some form of either reflective journaling or critical analysis prior to the meeting so that everyone is coming with some work already done, that they're not coming to just passively sit and hang out and maybe complain. I mean, we, we tend to like to complain when we get together about everything that's going wrong. Try to keep it positive. Try to keep it productive and constructive. Um, and that can be done by, by having each person commit to doing a little bit of work before. Um, and then, like I said, setting some kind of agenda and sticking to it. Um, it will make it feel more collegial if we go back to that adjective we talked about before with networking. So this is a regular thing. It's semi-formal. And it does definitely foster growth if everyone makes that commitment. OK, this is another one that a lot of people talked about was peer mentoring. Um, this is when two teachers make a commitment to help each other with specific classroom or teaching concerns. Um, this could include many things. This could, again, include reflective journaling. It could include um, you know, discussing different topics. It could include observation. Um, so this is one that we think about a lot, but we don't necessarily seek out, right? So think about something that, you know, if you um, are looking for a mentor, or if you're looking to be a mentor, think about the qualities that you would want in a mentor, right? What are the kind, maybe um, that could be some of the things that you want to improve yourself on, or it could also be just the type of person, right? Maybe, you know, in someone that you know you would work well with. So this is something that would happen regularly. It's semi-formal, and this gets at what Ellen Myers was talking about with nurturing teacher leaders, is that this is an opportunity for um, your, you, yourself, and your department to foster leadership. So as an administrator, you might want to think about how you could implement a mentor program if you don't already have one, which I know many places do. 
Okay, so the next thing is action research. Um, this is a, action research is a huge topic which we could spend um, lots of time talking about. So essentially, it's an opportunity for you as a teacher to identify a problem or a question about teaching or some other aspect of your classroom um, and developing a plan or solution. Then, if, then uh, based on that, you collect data on the success of your plan or your solution and you commit to making future changes based on the analysis of that data that you collect. Um, and then you might repeat this process. Um, if you're interested in learning more about action research, there will be links to um, online websites and published resource uh, on the webinar um, site and at the end of this presentation. So this would require you working with a small group of teachers. Um, you know, you could do this with teachers who are not local, but it um, provides a lot of interaction um, and requires a good amount of, of work and commitment. So sometimes it would be helpful if these teachers are, you know, in your institution, in your department, or at least in your local area, because it would require um, a good amount of communication. So this would happen over a period of time. It is a more formal form of professional development because it does require a commitment and it does require research and adhering to some of those more um, research norms, I guess you could call them. But it definitely fosters growth because you're getting, you're getting um, you know, probably a good amount of data depending on how many teachers are participating because you're getting data not just from your class but from other classes. Um, and so it's going to give you some, some real a legitimate amount of information to make informed decisions about your classroom in the future. Okay, so the next one is student pen pals. Um, pen pals are, you know, this traditional form of communication via letter writing. Um, and if you wanted to do it through email, you could do that too. But, you know, it's very easy to do this without technology um, if that's not accessible to you. So Student Pen Pals is a lower tech way for you to collaborate with a teacher either locally or maybe even not that's local. Um, the collaborative spirit here is in the planning and the reflective aspects of the project because you would need to communicate with your colleague that you choose to do this with about some of your expectations and your goals, um, maybe how you're going to execute this, reflecting on it, um, and even about the content of what students are going to write about. <laughs> so it will require communication up front about, you know, all of these things, the topics and expectations and goals. Um, if letter writing is more prevalent in your culture, this might be a great way to include some collaboration with a teacher outside of your institution. Um, if you don't have the opportunity to, you know, mail those letters to another teacher at another institution, you could do it right within your own institution and you just collect the letters from your students and you give them to the other teacher by hand. So this would be over a period of time. It's semi-formal. Um, it's not completely informal, I think, because it does require some commitment and planning and follow through once you get that process started. But it definitely fosters rapport you know, among the teachers and also among your students. Um, and it maybe you know gives your students an idea that your um, your class is is connected to another class in another way that the teachers are on the same page and working towards a, a common goal, which can be really positive. Okay, so we are going to go back to the polls, and I'd like you to share once you have participated in one or more of the forms of professional development. What would you do? So imagine you, you do one of these projects, maybe you already have. Um, what would you do? We have write a reflection, write a presentation proposal, write an article, or maybe some other thing. Okay, so we have a lot of people that would write a reflection, um, which I think is a really positive way to think about what you're doing in the class how you're collaborating, what you would like to do in the future. 
It's a very powerful tool. Okay, so many people would write a reflection. Some of you might write a presentation proposal. Um, what I'd like to get out here, you know, reflections are very important and very powerful tools for us. Um, but once you've completed projects like these, it's really important to share what you learned um, or the best practices that you have determined. Um, share those with your colleagues. Um, it's very important because you know, many of these things that we're doing, we're exploring, we're trying things out. So the more I can learn from other people before I try something out in my classroom, um, the more I, empowered I feel. So it's really important to share what you do in your class with other people, especially if you're trying to utilize your network. Because the more you share, then the more other people are going to want to share what they do also. Okay. Thank you for that. OK, so our next part, we're going to switch from our lower tech options to some of our higher tech options. So we have these that are on the horizon, right? These are a little bit you know, trying to reach people that are further away from us, maybe not within our local community. They could be. Um, but they don't have to be, and maybe you know, implementing some more technology. So if you don't have access to some of the pieces of technology that we're going to talk about, um, that's OK. You know, maybe in the future you will have the opportunity. Or maybe think about how you might adapt what we're talking about to something that you do have access to. So we're going to go back to the polls. And what I'd like you to do is check all the ways that you already use technology to collaborate with colleagues beyond your local community. So what things do you already do? And I'm sure we do some of these things without even thinking about it. But the key you know, is to start doing these things with intention. OK, so we have almost 100% email. Yeah, definitely email is is key, I'm sure, for a lot of you know, when we're trying to reach people outside of our local network. Some phone calls and definitely social networking sites. OK, great. And some file sharing opportunities, too. Excellent. So we're going to start to talk about some of these options for technology. Um, the first thing that I'd like to talk about is Google. Um, you know, and again, if you don't have access to Google, that's OK. There's ways to replicate these um, activities and opportunities you know, through email or maybe other file sharing sites. But I wanted to show you some ways that you can use Google. So raise your hand really quickly if you have used Google Drive in the past, if you're familiar maybe with some of the things that Google can offer you. Oh, lots of you. OK, seeing lots of hands. Raised. <laughs> Erica says my students say Saint Google. That's funny. <laughs> okay, so Google has lots of options, and something I'd like to kind of really emphasize is that you know you just need sometimes you just need to take the time to explore some of these things, right? Um, you know, a lot of these you know pieces of technology can feel very overwhelming at first. Um, don't, you know, don't get down on yourself, like, take the time to explore, see what works for you, you know, just because someone else is using, um, you know, Google Drive doesn't mean that that's the best option for you at this time. So explore them, become what's familiar, you know, become familiar with what's available and see what works best for you. Um, so we have Google Docs is an um, option for file sharing, um, and it has a comment feature, which is what I'd like to highlight today. Um, Google Plus is a form of communication. It's similar, I think, to social networking opportunities, but obviously it's not as prevalent or popular as some others. Um, but there are some, some uses for that. Google Sites allows you to create a website. And then we have Google Forms, which allows you to create surveys, um, which maybe you've done with your students, but you could also do with your network, the teachers in your network. So the first one that we're going to highlight today is Google Drive and specifically Google Docs um, or Google Documents. <laughs> if you um, so, if you have a Google account, you will have access to this. This is a, a screenshot, right? 
And the arrow is showing that yellow, green, blue triangle, which is the symbol for Google Drive. Um, so you can click on that, right? You see your other options there of, you know, Gmail and YouTube and Google Maps and all those different options you have in that menu. But we're going to look at Google Drive and Google Docs specifically. So this is a screenshot of mine. This is within one folder. I, um, I have many other different folders and documents that are uploaded to it. This is actually a project I'm working on right now, um, which is a collaborative, reflective journal. Um, so I'm keeping my journal right online rather than in a notebook. Um, I'm putting up my all of my lesson plans. So I put up my lesson plan for that day's lesson, and then after the lesson, I write a reflection that corresponds directly to that lesson plan. Um, and then once I post that, it looks like this. You'll see this is a pretty early one, Lesson Plan 3 Reflection. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you will see this is where the collaborative aspect comes in, is that um, my colleagues within my network are able to comment on my reflection. Um, and I'd like to point out that I live in California, and these three other people that are working on this with me um, do not live anywhere near me. Two of them live on the east coast of the United States, um, so they're in a different time zone. Um, and one of them lives in Canada, on the east coast of Canada. So none of them um, are near to me. We haven't um, had any face-to-face -face interaction on this specific project. I know them very well. Um, but we don't meet in you know face to face. It would be impossible for us to have a teacher support group um, because it's just because of geography. But this is a way for us to stay connected as a network um, and also for us to do some professional development. And it's not costing us any money. I don't have to pay anything to go to a conference. But yet I'm getting some really constructive feedback um, and support from these colleagues. And these I. I asked these colleagues to do this with me. They all teach ESL, but in very different settings. Um, so, you know, I'm writing this journal about a um, intense from an intensive English program perspective. Um, but I have one colleague that's in adult education, one that's at a university, and one that's K through 12. So I'm getting lots of different types of feedback too, which I really like. I like to have very differentiated feedback. Um, so this is an option. You see the arrow where it points to comments. It's very easy to use, which if you're familiar with Google, then you know a lot of things are very user-friendly. So they can write comments to me. Um, I can write comments back. And then there's an option, actually, which is called Resolve, that I can click on their comment box, put Resolve, and it will disappear. So it's this idea that I can kind of fix or, you know, if I don't want to see that anymore, if it's not relevant anymore, I can get rid of it. So this is a really great way to use Google Docs. You can, you know, implement this in your classroom also and having students comment on other students' work if that's something that you do um, for writing or things like that. Okay, something else for Google is Google Sites. Raise your hand, raise your hand, if you have ever created your own website for a class before. Great. Yeah, so definitely, okay, so maybe, okay, so we have a good amount of people, maybe not as, as many with some other things. Um, this is a very basic way to build a website. It's, it doesn't, it's not very fancy, I guess you could say. Google does give you some options, you know, some formatting options, right? They have some different backgrounds and things like that. Um, but this is a tool that you could collaborate, you know, that you can share information with your class, but you could also create your own professional website that's just for you, or maybe you share you know, you post different information, maybe you post videos or documents or um, professional articles, and then you have a link that then you could then share with your network to say, oh, I posted a new article about 
vocabulary strategies today on my Google site. Check it out. And then you put your link in your email or whatever it else is, and everyone can have access to the resources you're posting. Um, this specific site is one that I created with um, some other teachers that were teaching the same students as I was. We were teaching different classes, um, but it allowed us to share resources with the group together. Um, and then it served as an archive. So our former students from a couple of years ago can now still access this information if they wanted to. Um, so it serves as an archival feature also. And again, there's the same comment feature. So if you wanted to create a discussion thread, you could do that. Or if you know you could give your students or the other teachers that you're collaborating with the rights to upload their own documents or their own links so that it again becomes more collaborative the more that you allow other people to interact with you. Okay, so the next part we're going to go into is um, has to do more with um, kind of social media things that we can use. Um, and I wanted to bring up this term of professional learning networks, so or PLNs, as they're often referred to. Um, so this is a term to define this idea of connecting with other people. So exactly what we've been talking about, this is just um, you know what we might call a buzzword, right? a popular word to refer to what we are doing. Right? And sometimes people call them a personal learning network, um, which I think is um, very normal since it makes sense, since many, much of what we do in our professional life um, becomes part of what we do in our personal life, especially with so much technology now and mobile devices. Um, we take our work with us almost everywhere, I feel like, anyway. Um, so this is just the process of using your, your network for professional development, connecting and collaborating, organizing, prioritizing, all of those things that we have been talking about. So mainly we're talking about managing your network, and this idea of a PLN is a great way to talk about that, um, and so social networking sites can be a great way to organize, right? Um, I saw in the chat box many of you have been mentioning um, Facebook groups, right? So you have this option on Facebook to create a group, um, you know, that can be very empowering, right? If it's, you know, within your institution or maybe within your country or, or within the level that you teach, right? Maybe you teach secondary or high school students, right? And you want to have a a Facebook group or some other kind of group where you can all collaborate with all of the other high school teachers in your city. Right? That's very powerful to have access to all those people. So managing and prioritizing information um, and categorizing, talking about how to group our information so that it's easy to find. Um, if you're familiar with social networking um, sites, then you might be familiar with this term of following. Um, following professional organizations or people. So this is the idea that you can um, like them, if you're talking about Facebook, or follow them on Instagram or Twitter, right? that you then have access to everything that that person or organization posts, whether and it provides you with updates either on what they're doing or information. And the last thing is sharing. So this word comes up so often in networking. And you know, if you are talking about lower tech ways, you can easily share things, right, face to face or a phone call. But so much of what we share is online these days. And so these social networking sites become very um, easy. It's an easy way for us to just immediately share information if it's a link or something else. So, and since this is such an important use of our network, it is um, a great way to think about how to use these to the best of our ability. So, I'm going to share with you some different social networking options. Um, you may be familiar with them, you may not be. Um, again, this is where, you know, not getting overwhelmed and exploring things can come in. So, this is a screenshot of my LinkedIn app on my phone. Um, and we don't have any app information today. 
Um, but again, feel free to explore these um, and see, you know, what works best for you. So here I'm part of different groups, right? TESO is the California TESO organization. So again, they will post updates. We just had a regional conference this past weekend. So lots of people were updating, um, talking about different presentations and workshops that they attended. Um, so having, again, just having access to information and being able to organize it in order to find it easily. So this is a screenshot of the mobile app for Facebook, which you're probably familiar with. And this is the T-Cell site. So again, they're posting information and resources, which can be very helpful. So raise your hand if you are on Facebook in a professional capacity. So for example, you have liked professional organizations or you post teaching concerns or share education related articles. So many of us might be on Facebook for personal reasons, right? But how many of us are on Facebook in a professional capacity where we maybe we have a Facebook group with our colleagues or we share, you know, maybe you read a great article um, on, online and you want to share it with your colleagues. How many of us go to Facebook to share? Great. Yeah, I'm seeing lots of yeses. Excellent. So that's, um, that's really great that we can utilize these resources. Um, something else I wanted to mention about um, Facebook, right, is that, you know, we talked about Facebook groups, you know, either colleagues in your local area, maybe alumni from your school or alumni from some program that you completed, whether it was maybe a presentation or a course, or even, you know, um, I know many State Department programs have an alumni group that you can reach out and talk to. It can also give you a voice. Um, I have a colleague that, you know, runs a Facebook group here in the U.S. that deals with some K through 12, right, elementary and secondary school issues, and it really gives them a voice to communicate and collaborate on their professional issues, not, not necessarily about the classroom, but maybe some things that they're dealing with as a, as a teacher in the U.S., right, in that system, and being able to um, combine forces, I guess you could say. Okay, so here is the Facebook site for American English at State. Right, again, getting updates and information, links to other information. Right, so if there's somebody that, you know, a person that you really respect in the profession, you're going to probably um, want to read whatever they're posting, right, because they might be posting links to other things. So Edmodo is another site <clears throat> that um, this is where you can create a group and you can share, again, so, you know, if you're not on Facebook or maybe you don't want to be on Facebook, um, this is another opportunity where you can create a group um, on online to share and collaborate online. Um, and I just um, talked to a teacher this past weekend that uses Edmodo with her um, student book club. Um, and they, their book club only meets once in a while, but then they kind of continue their conversation on Edmodo. So it's an opportunity you could do this in conjunction with your teacher support group. So maybe you only have the opportunity to meet with your teacher support group, you know, once every other month just due to everyone's time constraints. Well, you could, you know, maybe post some pre-questions and post-questions, kind of like we do here on Edmodo. Um, this is a screenshot for Feedly. Sites like Feedly and Pinterest are great for organizing information, prioritizing information, making it easier, you know, making things efficient so you have time to do other things. <laughs> um, Skype, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, right? This is your um, ability to make phone calls over the internet. Um, so maybe if you have an internet connection, but not a great um, landline telephone connection, this could be an option. It also allows for video calls, right? If some people, you know, I know some people really want to be able to have that 
um, nonverbal, you know, aspect of communication, being able to actually see the person that they're talking to, this can be great for that. Um, so, you know, and also it can be great for having multiple people on the call. Okay, Instagram. So some of you might be familiar with Instagram um, and selfies, but you know this would be an opportunity to share photo and videos. Um, you know, if great, maybe you have a great lesson or your students do a project and you really want to share what they did. You know, and you can do that through a picture. Instagram is great. Again, you have this idea of following professional organizations or people, and then also. Um, doing searches, right? So if you're familiar with the hashtag, um, you can search for specific types of information. So again, this becomes being, a, you know, within your PLN, um, your professional learning network, being able to access information is very helpful. Um, YouTube also for video sharing. Um, something that has become, you know, nice on YouTube is now there are YouTube channels. Um, so you can, again, find all information in one place. I know American English has a, is on YouTube. Um, and in this, again, if you want to share, rather than writing a reflection or a description of what you did in class, this is an opportunity to actually take some video for other teachers to see and experience what you are doing in class. This is a way for you to share what you're doing. Um, you know, maybe if you don't have access to professional conferences, or you don't have um, the time to attend them, you know, this is a way for you to share what you're, what you're doing. So instead of maybe doing a proposal for a presentation after you complete, um, you know, some collaborative project with your colleague, you could share maybe some of the video that you, um, you know, demonstrating what you were doing, and what kind of project um, you had. So I would like to go back to the polls and kind of reflect a little bit now. And I'd like, you, I'd like to know how easy do you think it would be for you to add just one, just one of these pieces of technology to your teaching toolbox. So, you know, we don't, like I said, I don't want you to be overwhelmed. Think about if you could pick one of these things. So would it be very easy to implement, somewhat easy, somewhat difficult, or very difficult? And this, again, doesn't necessarily have to be technology. It could be one of the low-tech options, too, like the teacher support group or peer mentoring. You know, if you could pick one of these things, do you think you could implement that? Okay. So it looks like maybe, you know, some of you are saying very easy and some of you are saying somewhat easy. But hopefully... It looks like almost all of you think that you could do something on some level. That seems like very few of you think that it would be um, difficult. And none of you think it's very difficult. So that would, that's great. Okay. So with that said, what I would like to suggest is that you set some goals. So now you think about, okay, you know, we've, You've heard about a bunch of different things. Maybe some you've already done. Maybe some you've heard of but you haven't used before. And maybe some new ones. And now you want to think about what can I do. And I would love for you to set some goals. So what can I do today? Right? Let's not, I don't want you to be overwhelmed. So think for a second, if we go back to the very beginning of the webinar when we're thinking about um, how to create our network. Raise your hand if you can think of one person to whom you would like to introduce yourself or with whom you would like to reconnect. So go back to the very beginning. Think about just going back to creating your network. Is there someone that you would like to introduce yourself or someone with whom you would like to reconnect, maybe someone that you have, um, you know, met before but you haven't talked to in a long time and you know that they would be a valuable resource in your network. Can you think of one person? 
As our sister there's a lot of people I want to introduce myself to, which I can understand also. <laughs> Linda Mar says, all of my 92 teachers. Okay, great. Great. So, you know, that what I want you to take away is that this, you can see huge impacts with just small changes. Adding one person to your network can make, can, you know, can change the dynamic, can make a huge difference. So start small. Don't feel overwhelmed. Don't feel like you have to do everything. Pick one thing, right? Maybe it's, maybe you introduce yourself to one new person, right? That can change a lot, okay? So I have several challenges for you today. I want you to challenge yourself a little bit. The first one is walk down the hall in your institution or your department and either introduce yourself to a colleague that you don't know or ask someone you do know what they've been working on lately in class and more importantly, how it's going, right? So, so interact with someone today, right? Or maybe tomorrow because I'm sure it's getting late for you on your day. The second challenge I have for you is to reflect on what you've been doing lately and see if you can ask a colleague to take a look and discuss your reflections, right? Um, you know, this can be on a myriad of things. It could be on your teaching. It could be on your assessments. It could be on anything. Take some time, which I know that can be the hardest part is finding the time, um, but do some reflection but not just reflect, share those reflections. Share those reflections with someone else and get their feedback because I think what you'll find is a lot of support and then maybe some suggestions, right? You know, things aren't always as bad as we think they are or maybe, you know, we think things are going really well but maybe our colleague can say, did you think about this, right? My third challenge for you is to think about one piece of technology, if it's available, that you could take some time to explore. So again, don't get overwhelmed. Maybe if you're already familiar with Facebook, which it sounds like you are, then maybe you explore how to create a group, right? If you're already familiar with Google, maybe explore a new part of Google that you haven't done before, like Google Sites or Google Forms to create a survey for maybe the teachers in your institution um, to talk about different things. You could even create a survey, you know, in preparation for a lunch and learn, right? You know, maybe you can take the initiative to create a lunch and learn next month and you want to send out a survey to your colleagues to determine how best to set it up. When is a good date, when is a good time, and what are some topics? So there are ways to implement this you know, in a in very um, in the very near future. Okay. Finally, I'd like for you to set some professional goals for yourself. So obviously, just by attending this webinar, you're participating in professional development, which is wonderful. You're taking the time to improve your craft, and that is great. Um, but what I would say is find a specific goal. So for example, maybe you tell yourself, I am going to in integrate three new vocabulary strategies um, in the next four weeks, or I'm going to start a, collective, a collaborative working group um, at my school, um, or you know, I'm going to plan a lunch and learn, or I'm going to talk to someone about conducting an action research project. Think about right now, Right? And something specific. What can you do within the next month or so? You know, don't, you, you, if you make too big of a commitment, then it might be hard to follow through. Find something specific that you know that you can accomplish. So some of my most rewarding teaching experiences have been collaborations with other teachers because I felt supported and we were taking risks and trying something new. Um, it doesn't always mean we were successful. But, you know, then we go back to our reflection, we think about what happened, and we try again. But this idea of doing something new with someone else made it very 
exciting, right? And then finally, we were intentional in our teaching. I felt like if I was collaborating with someone and making a commitment to another teacher to do something in a certain way, I had to be very intentional. I couldn't just, you know, make my lesson plan the night before, like we sometimes do. We all do it or right before class, right? If I had to have a plan, I had to be intentional in my teaching, and I think we're always more successful when we have that intention. So I'm going to um, put up some slides with references, but please take a look at the supplemental materials um, that are going to be posted in the main site um, and participate in our discussions online. Um, you might even find a collaborator among the participants today. Uh, I already know that some of you are very supportive on the main site and able to connect with each other on there, which is wonderful. So um, I look forward to our discussion continuing over the next week or so. Um, thank you for um, joining us. And I want to leave you with this quote, which is, start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. Um, Arthur Ashe is a famous American tennis player, um, but I think I like to share this with my students also um, because, you know, I, again, not this idea of not getting overwhelmed, exploring, you know, even making small changes is going to have a huge impact. So start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. Okay, so the next, the last few slides are references for the photos that were used, um, the books that were referenced, and Thank you so much, Amy, for that great presentation on networking today. I think we all got some valuable tips for how we can expand our professional networks, both online and face-to-face. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your expertise with us today.